Hello, everyone. Welcome to this new Rhino user webinar, and thank you for joining us. I am Guillermo, and today I'm here with my colleague from Magnil Europe, Carlos Perez, and Timo Harbo Nielsen, who is going to present this webinar about computational design in structural engineering. Timo is the computational design lead for the buildings division of Rumble Denmark. And before joining Rumble, he worked in the engineering department of Jark Engels Group. He has a master's degree in architectural engineering from the Technical University of Denmark, where he, he specialized in computational design in structural engineering. In this webinar, he's going to show how Ryan and Grasshopper are used in a large engineering consultancy like Rumble, showing several examples with live demos, and will include a discussion about the challenges and possibilities that computational designers face in the conservative building industry. You can pose your questions for Timo in the chat and we will answer them in the last 15 minutes after his presentation. Remember that this webinar is being recorded so you can watch it on YouTube after it finishes on our playlist, Rhino User Webinars. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss the new webinars that we are organizing. Thank you again for joining us and Timo, please start the presentation if you're ready. Thanks Guillermo okay. and Timo. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for, for, for joining in here. I'll uh, just to share my screen with you. So let's, uh, do you see my, uh, my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, so yes, I, I want to talk uh, to you uh, about applied computational design and structural engineering. So very much about how we actually use it in, uh, in practice. And I'll be showing a lot of live demos today. So also have a little bit of patience with me if uh, things sometimes go a bit slow or if anything is crashing, uh, you never know. But um, briefly about myself, uh, you just got a brief int uh, intro now, but uh, I'm in a role as computational design lead in the Rample Buildings Department in Denmark, where I sit in our high-rise department. Uh, and I also do a lot of uh, structural engineering. So I'm kind of in that interface between computational design and structural engineering. Um, just to give you a brief overview of some of the projects I've been working on and applying these computational design methods to, these are two projects from back in uh, the days in Bjarking's group, a beautiful art installation at the Burning Man. Uh, absolutely amazing project uh, to be part of. Lots of uh, rhino grasshopper in that one. Uh, three smaller towers in, in Denmark, uh, a tower in Aarhus, and a, uh, this one is built. And this uh, bridge I'm gonna show you a little bit later in some examples. Also use lots of computational design in that one. And then uh, there is a tower in Aarhus uh, that I'm currently uh, engaged in. And then there is a project in Milano that I also did back when I worked in the Bjarke Engels group uh, where Rampel was also involved. So these are some of these uh, the projects that I've had the, uh, the fun of, uh, of working with in like, these last few years. So I wanna take you through five points here. I'm going to sprinkle all the points with a bit of examples so it doesn't get too dry, slight showy. Um, but first, I want to just make sure we're on the same page about what computational design is. I'm going to talk about see, the cool projects and the regular projects, how we do computational design in Ramble. And then we're going to touch on this being a computational designer in the building industry, which is not the uh, most fast moving industry in the world, to put it lightly. Um, and then I'm just going to try to show you as many examples as possible uh, to really give some inspiration to how these methods can be used. But what is computational design? Because there are a lot of different points of views on this. And I like to express kind of my view on this with an example of a little <laughs> building project I've done at home, which has nothing to do with digital tools. Uh, I have built a little cabinet for a, uh, for a heater. And I was planning uh, to build this cabinet here. And I made some drawings and some, some details. So I have like these two bars, one on top 
one in bottom. And then I have all these little, uh, what do you call it, pieces of wood that I would put a dowel into, like drill a hole in the end, put a dowel in, drill a hole into this one here, put a dowel in. Uh, and then I would get this uh, beautifully, very uniformly spaced um, design. Then I had a friend of mine who's a cabinet maker who laughed a bit at me and asked me, how, how am I gonna do this? I'm just gonna take a drill and start drilling and expect it to look nice. So he introduced me to the concept of a jig. It's a woodworking concept. It's a tool that you make using the tools you have so you can solve the task you have in an efficient way. So I built this little ugly uh, wooden block that you see here uh, to, to drill my holes. So the idea is that I can always drill holes at the same distance. I can do it fast, I can do it efficient and with a minimal amount of error. But keep this parallel in mind as we go along. So you can just see like, here's a quick video of how this jig works in creating evenly spaced holes. So again, it's faster, it's more efficient, and I make less errors. And that is what computational design is also about. This building jigs, building little tools to solve the tasks we meet in our everyday life. And now I, I already went on to the next slide which is an example of a little jig that I recently created. Um, so I was working on this project where we look at facade deflections. So here you see a slap uh, contour view of uh, the deflections of this slab. But for these facade panels, I was interested in actually the values at discrete points at an even spacing along the facade. And I'm not kidding you when I say that the regular method of extracting these numbers is to go and hover the mouse on your plot, write it down on a piece of paper or Excel, and then move on until you have gotten all your points. But I could not get myself to, to do this. So instead I set up a little jig, so to say a little ugly wooden block, like I showed you before. A, a very little tool where I could just copy paste some data in from my uh, from my parameter, sorry, my uh, finite element model, and then I could create this edge curve, the deflected shape of that. I could just create that inside Rhino Grasshopper, and suddenly I could go in and I could extract the deflections at any point I wanted along the facade. So not only was I able to extract the uh, deflections at once every one and a half meters? I could also say, well, if we only space them at one meter, we get uh, these deflections, if, uh, these deflection differences between points. If we space them at half a meter, we get a difference, uh, different deflection difference between the points. Yes, yeah, so we're basically looking at what is the difference between the deflection in, in the corner and the next point difference between that point and the next point. So suddenly I actually solved the task I had to do. I solved that faster and I enabled myself to do much more thorough investigation of the options. So I did better work, less prone to error and more efficient. So this is what I think computational design is about. Um, just a little image of this very ugly jig. So if we boil it down to some fundamentals, I'd say it's, uh, it's about using what humans are good at, using it, what computers are good at. Uh, we are very creative beings. We can see parallels that can be difficult to really describe. And we have this consequential thinking that we can think ahead and we have, we have a background and an intuition that a computer doesn't easily have. But a computer works 24 seven, it remembers everything, it's unprejudiced. So together we are a pretty amazing team. Well, like what Peter Depney puts it, that the engineer, like to say the designer of the future is a Ken Tower, like half human, half computer. But what we have to remember is that computers are stupid. Like they, they, they are, do what you tell them to do, but not more than that. And just a little funny example. Uh, some of you might have seen this uh, little image I, I posted at one point, but I asked 
just for the fun of it, the computer to wiggle these points up and down using uh, Galapagos in, uh, in Rhino Grasshopper and try to get this line to be as short as possible. And it was running thousands of iterations, moving these points up and down until it arrived at this was a good solution for getting a really short line. But we know as humans that, of course, the shortest line is a horizontal line. The computer doesn't know that. So it just tries and it finds a decent solution, but it's not the optimal solution. It's actually a wrong answer. So we have to remember that computers are stupid and we have to use them in a, in a way where we keep that in mind. So we can have this uh, really awesome Kent Tower kind of worker. So what I want to get to is let's avoid this situation uh, where we try to get the computer to do everything. Let's do what we're good at and let the computer do what, what it's good at. Cool projects and regular projects. Often we see computational design advertised on really, really cool projects. Like I showed you this City Life Milan earlier, which I consider a really cool project. You couldn't really do that without computational design, I would say. Uh, also, this one, the Kiesterfoss Museum. Uh, it's also a really cool twisted design. Begs for computational design being applied to it. But in our cities, the main building mass is stuff like this here. Regular pretty buildings, but where the finding the use for computational design may be a little bit more, more challenging because it's not these funky geometries. And I want to focus a lot on this over here, because if we can get some smart working methods in on these projects, we have a lot, lot, lot more to win than if we only focus on the cool stuff. So just to show, like, these are just a few GIFs. So I'm going to get to some live demos later. Uh, but this is probably one of the simplest examples I have of such a tool. Uh, I had to try different sizes of uh, some squares, like drop panels in a, in a slab. So I just copy pasted some points over from my FE software. And I moved them in Grasshopper, as you can see here, and copy pasted them back into my, my FE model. Uh, this took maybe 10 minutes to make. It's not very impressive, but it saved me a lot of time and actually created a better model and I could investigate more options. Um, again, the tool I showed you before, regular work situation, nothing funky, but still creates a lot of value. We can also go a little bit more funky on regular projects. Like uh, I worked a little bit with some pile optimization compile distribution where I tried uh, to combine some Caramba uh, FE analysis with, uh, with some form finding using Kangaroo. Again, on a regular project where we got these uh, methods implemented. I'm gonna show you an example of one of these, you can say regular projects where I use a, uh, a, a tool for that. So I was involved in, uh, in a design or process of uh, investigating a design of a tower. And I was building an FE model, uh, a find element analysis model. As you can, you can see it here as, as lines. And everyone who makes models makes mistakes. And that's not a problem. It's only a problem if you don't find them. So rather than sending everything over to the FE solver, I wanted to find the mistakes in my model before sending it over. So I just did a few checks in, uh, in Grasshopper. One check was to see, are there any of my slab elements that has a surface normal that is quite different from all the other surface normals in the model? And then you can see there's one highlighted here because that one is, uh, is the only one with this surface normal. And you can actually see if you zoom in that, hey, I made a little mistake. It has a slight inclination. You can't see that before you, you do this check and you might not even get an error in your find element model. Um, other checks included um, to look at the same thing for beams. See, there's also a beam here that's different from the other beams in the model. So it's highlighted. So it's not necessarily an error. In this case it is, but it's something that, that needed to be to be checked out. Uh, 
So this can save me hours and hours and hours of debugging time just by putting in some sensible checks before sending the model to my software. Another check was to look at the, uh, what is called the valency of the nodes, like how many nodes meet in the same point. And then I can see that here I have a few nodes where only one node is in this point. So for example, you can see here, if I zoom in, that actually this column here is, uh, is ending in, in nothing. So that would create an error in when I do my analysis, but uh, I would like to catch it before that. So I don't need to investigate why I have instabilities in my model. That's an example of a very regular project, very regular workflow and incredibly high value added to the project because my find element model is of much higher quality. Let's uh, go back to the slideshow because then there are also the cool projects. I think this is a pretty cool project. Uh, it's a uh, shell. It's a uh, very thin concrete shell that we're looking at casting on uh, like EPS cut form work where I wanted to figure out like how much form work do we actually need for this shell? Uh, so then I could find out how many EPS blocks does it take to, uh, to cover this, uh, this shape. And then I can calculate the CO2 emissions from the form work based on my grasshopper model and all sorts of other fun checks can be done in, in Rhino grasshopper. So these are cool projects and I think this is uh, also what a lot of us really like to work with and where it gets really, really fun. Um, and I wanna show you actually this project I'm working on. I can't, let me just see if I can find the uh, model here. Is it uh, this one? I think it's this one. So this is a, uh, it's basically a, a shell. It's a very thin concrete shell that is standing on top of some blade columns. And I have used the same parametric model for the entire design process, which has been going on for months. And just slowly adjusting it and leaving old parts behind like static and then keep working on the new parts. So for example, one of the things we looked at was the orientation of these blade columns. So, uh, like they're optimal in terms of, uh, of the direction compared to the wind and stuff. And then for that, we tried to use uh, Galapagos to, uh, to try to rotate these columns in an efficient way, not to find the optimal solution because the optimal solution is uh, really an, an abstract term, but we could generate like 15 different options that we can give to the architects and ask them what they like better. So we had 15 good solutions and then they could choose what they like uh, to kind of move on in the next steps of the design process. So that was one thing we used this parametric model for. Uh, another thing, I'll just show this here, ah, that's the same thing. Another thing we used it for was in the early stages to do uh, analysis in Caramba, just to get an understanding of how this shell was working. And Caramba can really do like some pretty amazing uh, stuff and you can use Grasshopper to do all your visualizations. So in this case, we could look at how the stresses would be flowing in the, in the shell. And uh, let me just see if we can show uh, this. Well, oh, that's just the edge. So we could look at yeah, how the stress is flowing in the shell. What is the magnitude of forces? And then we could try all sorts of different shapes and make an informed decision on what shape we made our roof. So this here, like this is an older version of the script and I'm just gonna go into the, a bit of a newer one just to show you can see, it used to be a very, very clean script, but it got some, uh, <laughs> some outliers here and there. But um, let me show you this that I talked about with the form finding. So I think some of you have probably played a bit with the kangaroo form finding that you can go in and find different efficient shapes. And, and we could do this process connected to our find element analysis and 
give the architect some information on how the three different types of roof would perform without actually doing, without doing more work. As soon as we had this, it would all go pretty automatically. Then comes some of the bit more, in my opinion, funky stuff. And that is when you need to do some remeshing of this to make sure that your mesh includes all the different features, like your some lines you want to include, some support points you want to include. Uh, and But this is all done automatically. So every time we changed the, the, uh, the geometry, we would automatically update our, our find element analysis model. Uh, and in the end, we end up with a analysis mesh that looks like this. And you can see how all these nice features are kept in the mesh. So a really, really clean, clean model. And then we, you can see down here, it has grown very, very large, uh, this script. But it's because we define a full find element model in here with, uh, I can show you some results from a, oh, not this one from a finite, sorry, CFD model is the word we're looking for. So we are applying loads to the shell uh, based on a CFD analysis. We can, and we don't need to do any zoning of the roof or anything. We can just apply the loads uh, directly onto the shell. And then in the end, we can use uh, Strusoft. Let me see if I can get it over on the screen and do a full detailed finite analysis, finite element analysis with rebar put in as we, we wanted following the edge of the shell, a super clean model. You could never ever model this without Rhino Grasshopper. Uh, it would be, be impossible in my opinion. So this is, uh, this is one of those projects that could not have been done without computational design and without Rhino Grasshopper. Um, so I think this is my idea of a, of a cool project. So uh, I'm just gonna go back to this slideshow because there's also one thing like we can do all these cool things, but in the end we have to build it. So it's this kind of back and forth between doing some parametric fun stuff and then sitting down and doing some sketching of the, of the detailing. Like here you see a, an idea, one of the first sketches, not first sketches, one of the later sketches of the rebar in, in this shell. So this process back and forth uh, is super important. Now I'm gonna get to maybe some slightly more dry slides, and then I'm gonna get back to some examples because I wanna talk a little bit about how we work with computational design in, uh, in Ramble Denmark buildings. Uh, so Ramble is a big company and we have a lot of C, uh, sorry, computational design clusters around the world. Uh, and I'm the lead of the cluster in buildings in Denmark. Uh, and the way we are currently looking at things is that in a typical company, including Ramble, we have some cool projects and we have a lot of regular projects. And typically, when we look at what how computational design is focused, it's nearly all the focus on, on the really cool stuff and not so much on the regular stuff. And we're trying to shift that now, put more energy into really optimizing how we design regular projects and optimizing those workflows so we can really create some proper value with these tools. And then I'm not going to, this is like our vision statement, but I think I just want to take the last line and focus on that. It is about giving designers superpowers. I get superpowers that you can do these things here in Rhino Grasshopper. But in the end, it's all about delivering better projects more effectively, uh, simply creating projects of a higher quality in an effective way. And uh, there are a lot of things that we need to, to do to make that happen. We need to communicate what we can do with these tools to everyone like you. Some of you might have seen, I post a lot on LinkedIn with these things to, to spread awareness about this. We need to collaborate with each other, but I get back to this one because I find this the most important one of them all, I guess. We need to train people. We need to have an infrastructure for, for sharing things. And then it needs to get out on the projects because without getting out on the projects, it's all for nothing. And then we need to do research and development. So these are my six focus areas. Uh, 
for computational design in rambled buildings. And then for me, it's uh, like this actually taken from Sarah Almstedt. She's the lead of computational design in rambled transport in Denmark. And I really like the slide that she had that was about curiosity is the goal. Like we need to stay curious and we need to test things, we need to fail and we need to learn and we need to try again. So this focus on curiosity and failing, um, I think that's uh, that's the way forward. In our team, like if you see, this is uh, the team we have in buildings at the moment, where we're trying to keep track a bit on who can do what, uh, what are people's interests? What do they want to learn? What are you interested in getting involved in? And this is a team that we're constantly trying to, to grow. Uh, we're also uh, having a big global network with about 350 people in it now. It's actually called the Computational Design Guerrilla Network because we, uh, we believe that a lot of this implementation on projects take a bit of a guerrilla way of working. And then training. We are trying to do uh, get really some training started in Rambel Denmark buildings uh, based on some, you can say, regular project tasks. So not funky geometry, but Excel data and regular geometries. So let's get started there, and then you can always move on to the funky stuff. And then also some Python. Uh, I did a course recently in some Python visualization, uh, so taking data from our find element software and putting it into Python and creating some beautiful visualizations. Then I guess this is a, some questions I've quite often gotten from, uh, from a lot of you, and that is about the challenges that we face in this industry as computational designers. And I see that probably the main challenge here is the learning curve. It takes a long time to get fast at doing these things like you can sometimes spend a full day getting nowhere but the better you get the faster you work but it takes a quite a while to get up to speed so i guess my best advice is is ask for help study be curious and this ask for help is uh, i've got much better at that myself ask some programmers in the company ask some experts don't sit for a full day just fiddling around if you have someone you who can help you move on Another challenge is this, that normally when we solve problems, it's very linear. When you're 50% done, you're 50% done. With a parametric script, you're not done until you're basically finished, and then you're 100% finished. So it is a lot of work that you put in, and then in the end, you're really done. Um, and that is some, that's risky sometimes. If something fails along here, you're halfway through, you're still at zero. Uh, so I think actually my best advice is to evaluate the possibilities for using computational design, evaluate those prospects with more experienced computational designers. So here, hey, do you think this is possible in this time frame? Can you maybe help me? Um, management understanding. A lot of our managers don't know what you can do with computational design. So it's all about communicating the wins. And then I was asked recently if I saw myself as a specialist or generalist. And that was a quite a funny question because I guess I'm a kind of a specialized generalist. I am a programmer, but not a very good one. I'm an engineer. I would say I'm, I find myself a decent engineer. That's my, my main area. But there are a lot of topics that I know briefly, but not very much. And again, that comes down to we need to ask for help. You know the possibilities with, for example, Caramba but you're not a specialist, ask for help. And then there's the one I get the most, and that is that you're stuck somewhere in regular detailed design documentation. How can I ever get to implement any of these methods? And then I would say that computational design is not just about parametric modeling. It's about playing with data and it's about um, optimizing your workflows, whether they're geometrically defined or with data, and just force it through. Sometimes I accept that it takes twice as long, but then you learn from it as well. Um, and next time it might take half as long. I want to get to some more examples because that's uh, 
guess that's a more fun part. So uh, let's get back into uh, Rhino Grasshopper. Let's see the first example. I want to show us again back to uh, some of these uh, regular design issues that we have. We have in Ramble a really, really cool tool. This one here. It's a column design tool. So you can type in all the data you have for your column and you can calculate it and generate a report and you're good to go. The problem is that if you have a building with 20 different columns and 100 different load combinations, it's really difficult to, uh, to extract which are the worst cases. And then you need to type in manually in this app uh, hundreds of times and you, you might not wanna do that. So what we did was that with help from the developers of this project, me and a colleague, Julia, uh, developed a, a little tool where we could have developed it anywhere, but we decided to do it in Rhino Grasshopper to force people into the environment a little bit, um, where you can basically get a user interface up. You can upload an Excel file with all your column data. You can read your Excel file. You can run your analysis and you can write your output file and you can get some information about all your different columns in your building. So suddenly we have taken away hours of work from people because they can just plop it into this little app here. At, at the same time, we're giving people a little bit of a, a superpower because they can just take this little component out and use it um, in their own workflows. So uh, some of you may be familiar with these MN curves, so capacity curves of columns. And now you can actually just sit and parametrically play with these, uh, with these capacity curves using this Q8 uh, calculation engine. So let's say we change the length of a column and you can see how the stability failure curve is, uh, is changing. And uh, it's fine because I'm actually currently using this right now on a project to get a better understanding of how, uh, how our sections are working. And actually, I'll just show you uh, the window I'm working on today, creating some uh, MN diagrams for our, for our slabs using actually this column calculation tool. So you can adapt these tools to whatever needs you may, uh, you may have. So this was one fun little example of everyday tasks that can certainly be uh, applied with computational design. And while developing this one, I got basically all the code from someone else uh, who is more experienced than me, copy pasted it in here. So I asked for help. And uh, then I sent this on to someone else and they asked me for help to adapt it. So it's this collabor collaborative process that without that, this would never have been developed. If I had just sat down and tried to do it all myself, it would not have been here today. The uh, next example I wanna show is actually from my, uh, from my time in BIC. And that is this uh, City Life Milan project that I showed you before. Uh, we had a bit of an issue when we developed this project and that was that the uh, geometry was very much alive until a very late point in the, in the design process. And we wanted to uh, create a full Revit model, make nice drawings, actually have everything ready and an ETAPS finite element model. But when the geometry kept changing, we couldn't really generate that before too late in the process. So instead we put a lot of energy into actually developing a, uh, a par parametric model. And let me just see if I can get this one to do something. Say we change the geometry a little bit. Now I would hope to see something change here. That would be nice. Something is changing. So you can see how whenever I change this one, I am changing the entire geometry of the building. And uh, I can also change the column layout if I want to check out a different column layout. And then this entire uh, model here was linked to our find element analysis software and to Revit. So in Revit, we had everything ready with sheets and everything. In our find element software, we had everything ready with sections. 
So we just needed the architects to say, freeze, then we could click a button and 80% of the work was done. And that gave us an extreme flexibility. And it actually also ended up with the, the architects adapting this model to their own needs. So suddenly we were speaking in the very same language because we were using the same geometric definition, uh, which could really, really help us work better together and be better at actually incorporating each other's changes. Um, and of course, it also gives a lot of possibilities for other analysis, like it could be something for like roof inclination. You can see how that changes when you change the geometry. I think what was most important in this project was something like the floor area, that you could see how much floor area do we actually get when we start playing around with this here. Have goes from 19 to 16,000. So by using this model, we could also more easily satisfy the client's brief on getting the uh, right amount of square meters. So let me see what was, I have some more examples I wanted to show you. Let's see, we had, look at this one, City Life Milan. Here is a little uh, render of the project. Um, and then there is a, another tool that I worked at uh, on with Henning Larsen Architects that uh, is part of Ramble now. So I was working on a competition with Henning Larsen uh, Architects, or they're just called Henning Larsen now actually. Uh, I was working with Henning Larsen on a concert hall where the architects wished for a lot of timber columns inside, like skinny timber columns, and they could be fairly close, closely spaced with different density in different areas to create kind of like this forest of columns uh, feel. And the question I got was, how big does these columns have to be? And I had a feeling that they would come with a lot of different layouts and I could sit all day and all night and calculate those. So instead I decided to be a little bit proactive and create a super simple script that would uh, find, I basically come some estimation for the load on columns and then based on some Eurocode calculations, it would calculate the required size given those load estimations. So as you can see, it's maybe like not completely right, but it's a pretty good estimate. What is then cool is that the architects could play with this however they wanted. They could put whatever funky slap geometry they wanted into this. They could even place their own points and start Let's see if that works. Now that'll be good. It would move around with these points and see how it would affect the column sizes. So suddenly we could design together. It was not just me saying this works or this doesn't work. It's, it was a shared design process. So I think a tool like this is uh, also a quite neat example of how you don't always need to be 100% precise. 100% precise not in the early stage design at least, you just wanna have, have an idea of things, whether they look right or not, uh, and give as much design flexibility as possible. And what is now really cool is that I have this engine that I can super easily adapt to other projects. I doubt I'll ever need this specific tool again, but I'm 100% certain that I will need parts of it again. I have already used the uh, column calculation part somewhere else. And then I promised to also show you um, this bridge. I showed a bridge in the beginning. And that was uh, this one here. Vile Viewpoints is the name. So we were contacted by the architects of this one if we could help them out a little bit uh, because they had won this comp competition and they did agree that maybe this looked a little bit skinny. This, uh, this cantilever here. Uh, if, if we could look at what is possible and uh, like if this design is, is really feasible and if not, what needed to be changed. And I saw this and I couldn't help but immediately just set up a parametric model just to quickly tell them that, hey, we can check all sorts of different layouts. Just tell us what you wanna see. So with the same model, we would generate all sorts of different layouts. But in the end, what it boiled down to was to do a detailed analysis 
of a few different examples. So we set up this parametric model that started with this. We then combined that with a link to SAP, which is another find element package. Um, so we could look at the mode shapes of this bridge and look how different designs would, would work differently. Uh, we would look at the displacements and very importantly, we would look at the footfall vibrations. And I think we spent a little bit more than a week on this analysis. And in that week, I analyzed no less than 50 different options for this bridge. And I ended up being able to come on Friday with three different main options, like one with a big spans, one with short spans, and one with like medium spans. And I was able to tell them the exact consequence that would have for material usage. So suddenly you can sit in a meeting with a client and say, we have these three options that work. This is the consequence for this solution. This is the consequence for that solution and so on. And if they had asked me, what happens if we reduce the span maybe just by five meters, would that make a difference? I could give them a result within, within an hour or two. So it's a kind of design flexibility that you don't have with, uh, with conventional methods. And I think especially this linking uh, softwares together is something we use a lot. Um, there's one last example. I think we are, yes, right on time, it seems. Uh, it's something that I have not used on any project yet. I'm still very, very curious to actually get to use it. Um, but it's a self-organizing maps. And let me just see if I can find the, uh, it's this one here. So some of you may know of John Harding, uh, a, a very, very uh, skilled uh, engineer. And like he's a, and a skilled programmer as well. He posted on the Grasshopper forum some years ago, a little self-organizing maps script that I thought, hey, that, that looks pretty cool. Uh, the idea is that you can provide the computer with a few designs that you like. It could be this little twisty blue tower. It could be uh, this little twisty red tower. This not so twisty tall blue tower and this skinny yellow one. So I can analyze these four options and say, I like this one, I don't like this one. But self, what self-organizing maps can help you do is that it can help you generate a lot of other options. And then as you hear from the word organizing, it can help you organize them. So if we just start that, oh, uh, just click here. So it's an iterative process where it's uh, basically creating an organized map of your design space. What is really interesting about this approach is that you are not interested in the best solution, you're interested in a good solution. So if we just stop this one here again, now we say it's converged. Um, then I might say that, okay, actually this area over here, my buildings are performing better than they are over here. So maybe we look for a solution in this space. I might not take the first solution I came with, maybe I take this one here instead, or I check another few solutions in this area here and evaluate further. So I think this self-organizing maps here is a, it's a very good example of this Ken Tower kind of way of working that you do what you're good at. You could def define four solutions that you really like. And then the computer does what the computer is good at, organizing things and creating 200 other solutions. And I think um, that was what I wanted to show you to today. I think we have uh, 15 minutes left for some uh, Q&A. Yep, perfect timing. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you for sharing all, all these projects. We have already a lot of, of questions, but uh, the people can keep sending them and we will try to, to answer all of them or at least uh, the ones that we can. Excellent presentations and many greetings from your friends and colleagues on the chat. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm having seen a lot of questions about uh, the plugins that you are using and about the, the other softwares and how they how you connect Rhino with them, with like for example with Caramba or other softwares for for analysis. Yes, so it depends a little bit based on uh, how good the the different software providers are at giving you access. Um, for this funky shell I showed you, I used. A, uh, it was FemDesign, Struisoft FemDesign, and they have a really amazing team of developers who have developed their own link between Rhino and, and uh, Grasshopper and Struisoft. Then I have used BOM, this building habitats object model developed by Burr Happelt, open source project. I use that for several projects as well. Uh, so that's a bit of a universal link. And then in other cases, I've done some self-written uh, links, especially to ETAPs. So it depends, but I would recommend BOM. It's a bit of a learning curve, but it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, software. Yeah, for example, for the checker definition that you had, like uh, pointing the, the errors of a model or uh, just the difference, did you use any pl uh, plugin or it was just Grasshopper and some plugins that you can which ones again? Sorry. Yeah, just show the sample uh, showing, for example, the the surfaces normals and the the beams orientations. Ah, yes, that is all based on native Rhino Grasshopper components. Yeah, I try yes. as much as possible to use native components. Uh, and actually, if I could just go on a little sidetrack with that one, when we did this one where you had the user interface. It was actually a requirement for that component that we used nothing that couldn't be downloaded via the package manager. It mm -hmm. had to be that people would download this and just click, okay, 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 and then it would work. If you had to go on Food for Rhino, we had lost. Yeah, for many people, it can be uh, more difficult than it's uh, with the package manager. I think it's uh, uh, more easily to, to use. And it's I amazing. Know, you have used um, Grasshopper Player, for example. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, that can be um, useful for not using Grasshopper, just the definition in yeah. Rhino. So that's another option. But I think this connects with the, the next questions we have from uh, Michele Aquilo and Len Grasshopper, that is uh, uh, Christoph, the, the previous presenter of the webinar. And these two questions are quite similar. So um, they ask, how often do you use the script that you create? And how do you choose what is worth to script and what not to script in order to save time? And Christoph was asking, um, how do you do you share the knowledge inside a big company as Rumble? And I think this connects with, because, yeah, not everybody knows Grasshopper so well or programming or something. And, um... There's a truthful answer and there's the answer of how I would like it to be, but I'm terrible at reusing scripts. A lot of the things I do is very uh, specific for a specific need I have right now. Uh, and I sometimes put something up on a shared drive in the company and there it's also not being used very much because like people don't need these full packages that can do everything. Yep. What I use, on the other hand, is little like clusters, like a little group of components that can maybe do, do a typical visualization. They can do an import on export. Or I copy paste some little groups from an old script if I remember how, how they were put together. And so not as much as I would like to. But then this, how do you then share knowledge inside a, a, a big company like that? And we have a... We have a platform where we can share scripts, which I think can be really helpful, especially also for newer people uh, to see how other people put together scripts and get some inspiration for, especially links between other softwares. And maybe you can take that and adapt it to what you're doing yourself. Uh, so we are sharing scripts internally, but even more importantly, where we just started also a monthly newsletter in our, in our team, where we just show, hey, what have, us in the computational design group 
been working on and how have we utilized these methods so it becomes more of a inspi inspiring thing than a here is a script use it because in reality people won't <laughs> yeah so it's more about communication that uh, having everything organized yes better to to ask what you need right and we have a question that was more a particular, uh, I don't know if I can find it. Um, yeah, if you could please tell how you move points created, created from Grasshopper in the Rhino windows. Uh, it's a question from Nissan Tapa. It was something that you showed with a gamble. With ah, a yes. Uh, the Beams example, I think. Yes. I think, was it just, uh, where was it, I think? Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. There we go. I think it was uh, this one here. He ref. Yeah, exactly. So it was basically if you have a a point parameter here, and you say set multiple points. So if the points are internalized in your component, for example, like let's take these here, and you put those up here, and then if I select over here, you can move your points around. Yeah, exactly. I think that's clear. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so I think people is uh, thinking in the chat that a lot of plugins are used and maybe it's something more simple. Yes, but no, I'm really not using a lot of yeah, plugins. Yeah. I, I would actually say it can probably be limited to Karamba, Kangaroo, Weaverbird as the, the main ones. Mm -hmm. And I try to avoid and human, you uh, human as well. But apart from that, I try to avoid the other ones. Okay. Um, trying to the read chat, the... the chat is crazy today. Yes. <laughs> I, I think it's the, the record of attendance. <laughs> yes, I, that's More why than... I'm getting lost between the questions. But yeah, <clears throat> let's see if I can find anything else. I saw. Another question from Beam Corner. Uh, what was the plugin to show the agenda in the Rhino left top corner? I'm not sure what he's referring to. Uh, I don't know if it was the the areas or something, or do you know? Ah, uh, to so that's I think I know. So I think what he means is uh, how do I share? Uh, see my screen. I think for this one here. And that's a very good question. Let me see if I've organized this well enough. Uh, huh, yeah. It's a mesh to screen. So I actually cheat a little bit and I, it's just a, a mesh that mm -hmm. I show to screen. And it is from the, what component is this? It's human. Human, right. human yeah. yes. Yeah, and the same for the text, I think. Yes, yes exactly. Group. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if you, Carlos, can read any more questions because. Uh, well, I'm telling people that if we don't have time to cover mm -hmm. all the questions, that they should uh, later post on the Rhino forum, and I'm pasting the link there. But well, there there are some questions that are very technical. So referring to which is the best CFD or FEA software or plugin for Rhino, or how do you connect it to Revit with Rhino Insight or to SAP 2000 or to other uh, other analysis softwares? Then there are more like philosophic questions, like yeah, well you you told already how you share uh, knowledge in such a big uh, company as as Rumble. And others, what's the yeah, when it's better to to script or not? Uh, if there is one question that uh, uh, yeah, if how much can Rumble or or large uh, similar consultancies contribute to an open source solution? Because working in the industry, uh, I feel that the computational development is heavily restricted by not being open source. But I guess here, what is I mean. Some well, bomb. I don't know if bomb is open source. But bomb, by, bomb is open source. Open source. So there but, are many solutions developed by many companies. Yes. But at the end, you need computational engineers or designers in house, right, to yeah. adapt. To... And it's actually like it's 
It's a really tricky question because you often have this, like if you have an employee sitting full time, creating something that gives your company an edge, then your senior manager comes and say, why should we share this with the rest of the world when we can benefit from it? And then I come as an open source designer and say, well, someone else will, will contribute as well. So it's a, I don't see an easy solution. And I don't believe that big companies will, will change fast with this. Mm-hmm. But I believe we need to put some, put some pressure on. Uh, I had a fun example the other day where I posted my uh, a grasshopper template on, on LinkedIn. And it didn't take more than an hour before a previous colleague of mine from Henning Larsen had uh, like amazingly improved this template a lot and then shared that with the rest of the community. So suddenly like I'd done some work, he made it a lot better and suddenly everyone has a better template. Mm -hmm. There was another question that you had uh, that I actually really liked and that was this, uh, when does it make sense to automate and when does it not? Mm -hmm. This sometimes you get a project in the door where you get this question from, from management as well. It's like, can we just parameterize this completely? So we are prepared for any future changes that there might come. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have over-parameterized more projects than I would like to admit in my life. Where I've spent days making a parametric model to never, ever make a change in it. Um, so I think if you don't know what the future changes are going to be, there's, and the geometry is simple, there's no need to parameterize it. There's no need to script it. If you know what changes to expect, like you expect the the walls, like the core layout to move, you expect column lines to move, yeah, maybe then parameterize that. Um, But if you don't know what the changes are going to be, they're like, how are you going to define your your geometry? But sometimes you also just need to do it because it's fun. There was actually a question in the beginning asking what was the difference between parametric design and computational design. Well, parametric design can be done with any parametric solid modeler, only that with Grasshopper allows you to create your own parametric system and any variables that, that you have thought uh, about before, right? For, yes. For a project. But I also say computational design is... It's more broad. It, it, yeah, and it, it's more broad <laughs> and it's more way of working. It is this, like, for example, I, I showed you... If, just a few graphs uh, from work I've been doing today, where I have a little plug in doing something in Grasshopper. I export that data into a Jupyter notebook with some Python code to generate some graphs. None in that workflow is, is parametric because I don't need it to be, like I write a CSV file, press some buttons a few times, but it's not a parametric workflow, but it's computational design because I automate processes. And I think about the, <laughs> how I can optimize my, my workflows. Where parametric modeling is just geometry, which is defined by parameters. Nice. Any other relevant, well, all the yes. questions are relevant, but we are, short, uh, we are short of time and there are many, many comments and, and questions. Um, Yes, the webinar has been recorded. It's available on this same link. Um, Well, Paul Mertz asks, how is your position with your company? Are you working on normal projects and using your computational design experience or are you involved in several projects in a more consultant-like role? So are you working for other people inside your company? I would actually yes to all the questions. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I have a, I have <laughs> actually, I have two main projects that I'm attached to at the moment, mm-hmm. uh, where I do let's say normal engineering, like I'm doing some detailed design documentation now mm-hmm. for like uh, this funky shell project. So that's a lot of random grasshopper <laughs> stuff. At the same time, I'm doing going in doing some consultation on. It's like someone comes ask for help and say, can we set up a little script for this? Can you help with this? That I maybe spend half a day on a project somewhere helping getting someone started. Um, but I'm all the time attached to projects. I'm not 
having very little overhead cost. And honestly, I also believe that that's where you, you can create a bigger impact because you know what you are designing for, mm -hmm. like for, for real projects that are going to be built. And this is also a good answer and connects to a question by a student, by Andrea Ursini, uh, that says, what's your advice for a young engineer to best approach the world of computational design and enter the world of work? So I guess this is, well, which tools uh, to learn, how to learn with projects, and how to enter the world of work. I guess there are many companies offering nice positions or... If you and, have anything to say here. And, and also be okay with that a task takes five times as long, but you know in, in, in the end it's part of a learning process. Exactly. Sometimes writing the script takes you much longer than doing it by hand. No? Yes. And maybe you are not going to reuse the script, but you are going to re reuse what you learned doing that script. No? And like next time you will be more efficient. I would never be able to create the scripts I'm, I'm creating now if I hadn't completely over-parameterized some models in the past and been sitting for a week straight trying to optimize something that I could probably have done in a day. Yeah. Like it's part of this, like you need to fail. Otherwise, yeah. uh, it's, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Guillermo, any other questions, comments you think? No, I have still found anything to to ask i think the chat is also answering the question so uh, yeah that's great i think yeah, it, it was great today because many people were answering to other people mm -hmm. nice. i think what we will do next is um on the description of this of this video because it's being recorded we will add links to all yeah. the softwares that were mentioned like like bomb by buro Apple, by, uh, by about caramba rhino cfd uh, real flow rt i mean all of the FEA, CFD, uh, analysis, uh, plugins or softwares that can be connected to Grasshopper that we know about. We will put links to them. And, and yeah, uh, sorry, we are out of time now. But again, many thanks, Timo, to the audience. Also many thanks for watching. This was uh, a record today with more, uh, around 500 concurrent viewers. At the, and um, yeah. Again, if you have more questions, post them on the on the Rhino forum, and we will be will be covering this together with Timo and other users. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you so Timo. much, and Thank thanks you. to everybody for for joining in. It was great. So thank you. Have a nice evening. Same to you. Bye. Bye. Bye.